Good evening. Welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium. It's so awesome to see such a great turnout tonight. Um, on behalf of all the sea stars and how sound, I thank you for your concern and your interest. Um, tonight we'll be streaming this um, presentation live over our Vancouver Aquarium's YouTube station for the first time. And so we're all excited to have that feature in place. So basically our room here that seats 120, uh, our capacity increases to all the viewers on YouTube. So a thousand maybe, a million? How many do you think are watching right now? So a special hello out to the YouTube online viewers. Um, public programming hopes to reach uh, a larger audience that is interested in aquatic, uh, conserving aquatic life, which is, as you know, the mission of the Vancouver Aquarium. And so with that in mind, I'll present tonight's talk. We have uh, Dr. Jeff Marlyov speaking this evening. He has been studying marine life and house sound for over 30 years and monitored prawn nurseries and glass bund growth as indicators of environmental quality. Um, he's conducted surveys and assisted in establishing the rockfish conservation area in house sound. So he's produced almost 85 scientific papers and we are fortunate to have the opportunity tonight to hear him talk about his most recent sea star talk. Um, I'll present Dr. Martin Helena after we do. Dr. Jeff. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, in addition to Dr. Marliav, we also have <laughs> Dr. Martin Helena. Um, he has uh, graduated from the Ontario Veterinary College and completed a master's degree in pathobiology from the University of Guelph. He was staff veterinarian at the Marine Mammal Centre in Sausalito, and now he has a much more exciting job as staff veterinarian here at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, his special interests are in the medical management of aquatic animals with emphasis on diagnostic methods such as MRIs, endoscopy, sonography, anesthetic protocols, and improving surgical techniques. So I present to you Dr. Marty Helena. Thank you. I want to guarantee you that the interesting stuff is going to come from Marty because it's getting exciting. Um, we were getting discouraged, discouraged last fall and, and the vast Nor North America wide team that he is part of is starting to get us some results. So we've been wondering why are all the sea stars dying? Um, Actually, we had our shoreline purple starfish dying off over a period of a quarter of a century back starting in the 1970s, and it was identified as being a ciliate protozoan, uh, which infects starfish in the Mediterranean Sea and the North Atlantic with no pathology whatsoever. But when it appeared in our local purple starfish, it was causing parasitic castration and the males would tend to fall apart. Of course, it wasn't affecting females. And it was a process that occurred over many years and never wiped out the population. So that, that was sort of the background of my experience here at the aquarium. And uh, man, I can't see the screen at all because I'm under Klieg lights, but I guess that's for YouTube, okay? so. Um, a normal Pycnopodia, the adult sunflower starfish, is our largest, fastest, most voracious starfish. They're terrific predators. You can see lots of little spikes on top of them. Those can actually take down a, a fish. They can, they can kill fish with that. They've, like the crown of thorns, they've got a toxic bite. And uh, divers tend to like them when they see them because they're spectacular animals and we like displaying them. But uh, I don't know if you, how well you can see this, but it is a wall solid with Pycnopodia. And for a period of nearly a decade, it was getting worse and worse that way, where we had sites where there really was no marine life other than Pycnopodia. they just mow down everything. And then around Labor Day weekend, um, Lee Newman is a, a sport diver, so he was out on Labor Day weekend. My divers weren't in the water because they get paid. and so. It really started hitting the email on that weekend, and uh, some people had actually seen it before that weekend. Obviously, they would have seen it because we started right after the Labor Day weekend, and that's pretty advanced. That's a starfish falling apart in front of your eyes. And so Donna was doing a different job, and she came back with all these photographs. It was pretty horrendous. And so this is right at the beginning of September, and we're kind of at the bitter end at this particular site. The starfish are, are all of this species are all falling apart. And then uh, this is uh, 
probably a slightly earlier stage where they're just going limp and, and falling down. This was uh, what we started to do, which was to go to the other sites where we knew there were whole walls covered with these starfish. And, uh, and everywhere we went, they were either already very, very sick or it was over. It was completely over when we went to the south shore of Bowen Island. They, they'd all died off. So by October at Keats Island, this is what, what uh, Donna Gibbs termed a river of ossicles, just sort of starfish pus and the hard body parts remaining behind. But no, this, this is the site where you saw that wall covered with the starfish from summer of 2012. By 9th of October, they, they were all gone and dissolved. There, were, there was no evidence of any of them even dying. So uh, a really fine uh, consulting biologist, Neil McDaniel, who's also a very excellent photographer, videographer, went up to the north end of Indian Arm. Having, he had already witnessed this down in Burrard Inlet around Vancouver Harbor. And he found more or less intact sunflower stars on October 9th. And this is a, an isolated rock. This is the right-hand side of that rock. And then just 20 days later, that's where they were. There's not a single sunflower star. And that white out there is that necrotic debris covering the bottom. So we knew that it had happened within the space of three weeks. We had actually never succeeded in getting back to a place that fast. So it, it probably took less than 20 days. And uh, this just shows the different types of species that are being affected and uh, in addition to our, our sunflower star and it shows different degrees uh, to which they're affected. We started seeing other starfish species being affected slightly. The one at the bottom middle, the vermilion star, interests me because for a long time they were all perfectly intact. We weren't seeing any clinical signs in them but a few, a few have fallen apart and this is a little bit different than what we're seeing elsewhere. And so there's some geographic differences. I can't quite reconcile myself to all the evidence we've seen. Um, the top right slide is where Donna flipped the, the main predator of uh, sunflower stars, uh, Solaster Doss and I, over. And that's an arm of a dying <laughs> sunflower star in its mouth. And then this is what happens to them when they eat them. They get sick. And so, uh, and uh, Jackie Hildring has just recently up at the north end of Vancouver Islands found some leather stars, the lower left, that look very odd. But in Howe Sound, we've been seeing the leather stars in particular glomming down on this necrotic debris and just getting obese. They've been getting huge and they're all over the place. We've still seen a lot of them. So uh, this is a family tree of starfishes and the sunflower star is uh, up in that top group and they're not that closely related to any of these others and so if we put in a color coding to show you what's affected and what's not affected the close relatives of the sunflower star all seem to get affected and then does it sound okay um, and then we we had not seen the vermilion star or the leather star affected but we've turned them red now because there have been some isolated cases where they definitely get sick and we're also seeing some geographic differences this this is our own observations here in the area of how sound uh, the effort is now spreading down to california and hopefully it'll go north of vancouver island so online we have come up with categories um, and so category zero is that they're just perfectly normal looking and then they start sort of like their guts are twisted they crank their arms around <laughs> and look very uncomfortable and then they start deflating and showing lesions that's category two and then category three is where they're really starting to fall apart and then category four is where they have fallen apart and they're dead category five has to do with the babies um, and that's an interesting situation and I don't know how much Marty can get into it but we've seen perfectly normal looking babies where the adults are all gone, all dead. So this is uh, the kind of mapping we've got online. And uh, this shows all the different species of starfish and the different uh, types. Uh, so we were finding this uh, volunteer divers and aquarium staff in around House Sound, Vancouver Harbor in September. By October, it had gone up to the head of Indian Arm, House Sound, and it was spreading up the Sunshine Coast. 
and they were, they were just healthy sea stars that we were seeing in the South Gulf Islands. It wasn't until November that it jumped the pond and got across the Salish Sea from mainland British Columbia to the east coast of Vancouver Island. And at the same time, uh, it was actually, I think it was earlier than this, that it started showing up around the Seattle Aquarium. And, and they've not only been seeing it to a great extent in, in Puget Sound, but it's been, I think, appearing a little bit differently. We've got different species and such that are getting affected. And then December, uh, well, we lost the engine of our boat, and so th th I think there isn't enough effort for December. But uh, in January, you'll see that there were not, it, it appears as if there's not as much uh, happening in, in Howe Sound, but that's because most of the starfish are already dead. Uh, so all these possible causes, and I'm, I'm just going to introduce this because Marty's actually been working on it. And I had my, my pet, you know, my pet hypothesis was that, that it maybe it has something to do with the ciliate protozoan that we knew about. And it's absolutely out the window at this point. So this is an old slide. Uh, their ciliate protozoans are easy to identify. They would have been seen in all the veterinary screening, and that just wasn't it. And there are all kinds of speculations about wild and wonderful things with the ocean. But uh, overall, sea urchins and starfish tend normally to go into population explosions. And um, this does relate to raw domestic sewage. Uh, Malibu is a famous case where it became a monoculture of red urchins when they had just raw sewage from all the new housing developments going into the ocean. And uh, we're also, through the communication about this series of events in our part of the world, realizing this is happening all over the world. And as I said at the beginning, it has happened here before in different ways. So it may just be that, uh, that uh, Pestilence is one of the normal population regulatory mechanisms in a group of species, the echinoderms, that have a strong tendency to become highly populated. So uh, this shows the babies, and they, they start off with five arms in life, and then they just, the small arms are the ones they're popping out. And right around the necrotic debris, you see healthy little babies. So we've been seeing them all over, and uh, I'm not going to get into that much. This is a picture of pretty seaweeds around White Cliff Park. Uh, it was absolutely denuded when the starfish first died, and we're seeing a rapid ecological succession with little invertebrates showing up, seaweeds, and so that's sort of what we're doing. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Marty, because there's really been an enormous collaboration uh, amongst the veterinary community. Thank you. Well, good evening. Is this thing on? Can you hear me? No. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, we, I had to put this slide in so I knew when it was time for us to jump in, uh, and otherwise I wouldn't remember. So um, this is our veterinary team. This is our animal health department team. This is our Christmas card this year. And, you know, we're kind of responsible here at the Aquarium for uh, kind of the health of everything from sea stars to beluga whales. And typically we work very, very closely with uh, the, the keepers, the trainers, the biologists that are the kind of primary hands-on husbandry people for the animals. And then we work cl very closely with them for like preventive health kind of management programs. And then when we really get involved is when problems start. Um, so we do a lot of work here at the aquarium. We also do a lot of work outside and, and, and we do work with a lot of wildlife events. I admit this is the first time I've worked with a sea star mortality event, but it's been very exciting. Jeff got us involved. He started telling us about things way back, August um, through the long weekend of, of Labor Day in September. We knew something was going on, something was up. So we started kind of looking around, looking for opportunities to do uh, veterinary type things. So we dispatched uh, some of our team, and, and that's Dr. Kelly Britt. She's our, uh, one of our other veterinarians, or our other veterinarian. I guess there's only two of us. Um, and one of our veterinary technicians, Sean, and they are actually the people that do all the work, and I just take the credit for it, because that's what I'm good at. And, and they're out there doing uh, what uh, veterinarians do, uh, which is, you know, nothing. Right? They're just sort of standing there while the real divers are doing work. And, and this really is Jeff's story and Jeff's team's story. This, this, they're the guys who've done all the work. We've just kind of facilitated a little bit of ancillary stuff on the side. And I guess it's going to be hugely disappointing to you. I'm going to get this right off my chest right now because I don't want to wait till the end. But we don't know exactly what's going on. But I'm going to tell you a lot about the stuff we know that's not going on. And I'm going to show you how we kind of work up a mortality event because it's kind of interesting how it all kind of works together. So 
here's where we really get along and get, get involved. So the divers are down. They've got us out on the boats. We're out in the field. Uh, we're taking samples. We're talking to a few people around, around the world, around North America. We've got experience with different types of disease outbreaks, particularly in the invertebrates and, and hopefully particularly in the echinoderms like sea stars. So the team's out there. We've talked to people. We know what to sample for. We know what to do with our own animals that, that we process and do necropsies on. And we do veterinary things. We culture and do skin scrapes. And, and we submit things for different tests. That's what we do. Um, and we kind of keep paperwork going. So, um, okay, this is the other one I'm going to get right off my chest here because I get this all the time, all right? Um, it's not Fukushima, okay? Just, that's, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm really, really sure that it's not Fukushima, okay? Has everyone seen this map of the radiation and stuff? You know what it really is? It's, it's wave height after the tsunami. That, that's with the NOAA map, this, this poster on this magazine that you see that scares everybody. This is derived from a, a NOAA map that describes wave amplitude after the tsunami, all right? <laughs> Not spread of radiation, so everyone go home, relax, it's going to be okay. <laughs> um, so I, a few things on echinoderms, especially the asteroidia, the, the starfish. Um, there's all sorts of really neat things about them. Here's my one thing that I think is really cool, and that's this water vascular system. I always try to think of something cool when I, that I didn't know about really well before. And so they have actually three sorts of circulatory systems in, in their body. They've got kind of a hemolymph system that's kind of like our vascular system. Then they've got this whole digestive salomic fluid thing. And then they have this whole water vascular system, which is primarily for gas diffusion. And then the other cool thing they do with it is that's how they walk. And they basically suck in seawater, kind of filtered very, very strategically, so it's fairly sterile when it comes in. They bring seawater in, and then through a series of little muscles, they move it around their little tube feet. So they actually, their tube feet are really tubes. So they inject the water into the tube, it extends, the foot goes out, and then they relax it and comes back in, and that's how they move around. Cool, right? There you go, take home, cool factor. And there's some anatomy stuff, and there's some really cool stuff. And I'm going to spend about an hour on anatomy. No, I'm not. So while this is going on out, out there, um, we start noticing a few weird things at the aquarium as well. And so I, it's meanwhile at the aquarium, um, we start noticing animals are having difficulty here as well. And we start noticing that there's a real species predilection for who's being affected. And, and just like out in the field, just like what we're talking with people out in the field, um, that Pycnopody, that sunflower star at our facility is being horribly affected. And the animals are dying very, very quickly very similarly to what's being described out there. The only re really cool part is that we're actually able to sit there, watch, sample, and we know how, how long the animals have been sick. We've got records for how old the animals are. We know where they've come from. We know which tanks they've been in. We know there's some differences between how the animals are being affected in certain tanks. So it's starting to add a little bit more of inf information. So it's kind of interesting. Oops. I actually don't know what I'm supposed to point this at. This thing? That thing. Okay. Um, what am I doing here? So um, here, here's what we find. We've got a few species that are really, really affected, kind of like out in the wild. And we've got other species that seem somewhat more resistant. And, and species sort of tend to um, get affected and die off in this kind of weird order. The sunflower stars are dying first, the pink stars and the vast are kind of after that and sort of the successive kind of thing, which is sort of interesting. Sorry. Oh my gosh. And then we're finding out, um, taking a closer look, we're looking at, we're describing these things. We're finding there's sort of a, a commonality to the way the animals are dying. They, they start with sort of ulcerative surface lesions um, that we can see. Their viscera comes out, um, their gona uh, gonads, their um, digestive tracts start to extrude out of them. And then they, they do that melting thing. They, they lose limbs, which is unfortunately a, a very common sign for uh, sea stars. That's kind of how they all get sick. When they get sick, they trigger um, losing their arms. Some people th think it's a, just a generalized stress response. And they can regenerate those arms, as some of you know. And in fact, in some species, the arms themselves can regenerate into whole new, whole new sea stars. So it's they're kind of a tricky um, animal to deal with sometimes. Like figuring out if they're dead or not, that becomes sort of interesting. Um, pink stars as well. So these are the... Um, the uh, Pisaster, Brevis spinus. Uh, I put that guy up because he looks like he's got his hands up, like he's been arrested. <laughs> those guys are being affected. You kind of see them in, in, in just those various stages that Jeff was describing out in the field, that, those same kind of categories of disease. 
arms are falling off or they're kind of losing their structural capability or losing that kind of turgid appearance or become very soft and they're doing that disillusion. They're starting to dissolve. Oh, that's the tip. Okay. Um, this is a courtesy of, of Neil, uh, one of our videographers. And uh, I'll see if I can make this work somehow. Uh, it was this thing. Yep. One more. Try one more. I have to try and click somehow. There it goes. So this is a time lapse um, video series. You've probably seen some of this on on uh, on YouTube. Um, it's seven hours condensed down into about a minute, and uh, that's why it's all kind of jiggly and jaggly and stuff. Um, the the animal's not racing around nearly as fast as you think. But but this is the speed demon for uh, sea stars. This is Pycnopodia. They are probably one of the fastest sea stars out there. But you can kind of see them overnight. Um, limb by limb. Not, you know what's really freaky is you'll start seeing some of the limbs start moving away on their own. So we get, you know, all sorts of zombie diseases. Everyone's been watching too much Walking Dead. There's a whole thing going on. So you can kind of see the, the kind of general stage. And, and not very good. But again, we've got the evidence. We know the animals are here. We know how it's been, um, at least temporally, we know uh, the sequence of events that happens to different animals in our collection. Um, and at the same time, more and more people are being involved out there. We've got a tremendous citizen science group going out there, um, contributing to, to Jeff and Donna's and Jessica's uh, database. We've got terrific feedback coming from the veterinary schools. Some of the other aquariums up and down the coast are seeing similar things like, um, well, that would be cool. I don't know what that means, but let's try this. Uh, and then we um, start calling a few friends. Um, to see if they can help out. And that's what this slide is. This is, as of this morning, um, who's actually involved in the disease investigation. So it's not an insular kind of thing that we work on here at the aquarium. We are part of a, a community out there. And there is some incredible expertise out there that we can tap into very, very quickly. And the cool part about this is we can tap into people who are citizen scientists, divers, weekend people, people walking the beach, just interested, right up to people with PhDs and multiple years of experience like Jeff, all and everyone in between like us and sitting around in our vet lab. So it's really exciting because we made a few new friends, we've got a few visitors, and on that, thing, on that end it's been really cool. So um, doing more vet stuff. So once you've done your gross exams, you've looked at your um, uh, animal, you've taken your samples, you're uh, looking at clinical signs, you're describing the process of what's happening, we go to what's called histopathology and that's microscopic examination of the tissues um, that are uh, stained in a special way and looked at under a light microscope. Okay, so, um, and we send, in this case we're looking uh, at working with uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society which is uh, in New York City. Um, that's Dr. Elisa Newton. Um, she's our primary pathologist on this, although uh, honestly there's at least a dozen Six to, a, six to 12 pathologists that are working on this right now. Uh, these slides tend to come from Elisa. So what she's showing us here is just normal tissue from, um, from the surface, the ab oral surface, the top surface of a sea star. And that's just normal. I'm gonna spend again about 45 minutes per slide describing, no I'm not. I'm not gonna do that, mostly because I don't really know what I'm talking about. Again, normal kind of tissue. Um, so the, one of the key parts of this is nobody not nobody, but what we need to do is compare healthy and sick sea stars. And we're looking for differences in, in those animals. And we're looking at differences in those animals from a number of different angles. Histopathology is one of them, okay? So as we go through, we start looking at normal, uh, which is your left, and abnormal, which is your right. And what you're starting to see, and I don't know if I can point it out, but you're starting to see infiltration of different cells. All this purple stuff, those are inflammatory cells. They actually have inflammatory cells. They're called coelom sites, coelomocytes, if you will. Um, so in this slide, there's really not too many cells at all. The, the um, epidermis is very thin and structurally intact. Out here, you see this is edema, so this is fluid, this is thickening of the epidermis, there's infiltrate, there's necrosis, cells are dying. Um, and then these little purple guys, these are those coelomocytes, these are inflammatory cells. So there, there's actually a response to something going on in these animals, which is interesting, who knew? Laron, there we go. More. Um, this is the coelomic cavity, uh, kind of normal. 
Now it's being filled up with all these inflammatory cells. So inflammation is extending right from the top of the animal, from the epidermis, through the deep dermal layers, right into the salomic cavities. Inflammation, necrosis, infiltration of, tissue, um, of cells all the way through the animal. Obviously, from the gross look at them, I mean gross as in they really are gross, but gross as in big, um, looking at them, yeah, you know, arms are falling off, they're, animal, they're, they're melting. So yeah, it's not surprising that there'd be stuff happening all through the animal. But it's still kind of neat that we can look at that, categorize it, and, and go through the process of working it up. Just a close-up looking at necrosis. So this is just dying parts of the sea star. This, the kind of pink refractile bits are, is death. And that's a salomocyte. That's an inflammatory cell for a sea star. Kind of like a white blood cell for us. And the other interesting part is we have these support structures in the animals that seem to be particularly targeted. So these are called ossicles. This is kind of like a, a bony structural component, and they're supported by skeletal muscle. And in the sick animals, that's just being wiped right out. All that, all that stuff is going away. It's just dissolving, if you will. The interesting part through all of this, and we can go on and on and on, and they keep looking, and we've sent lots of samples to lots of different people. Nobody has been able to find a causative agent in those, sli in those slides. Okay, so no one's been able to find a protozoan, a fungus, a bacteria, or even evidence of virus. Things that we normally associate with pathologic events. Um, at least things that can spread from animal to animal. We can't find those in them, which is kind of worrisome because we can't tell you what's going on. Remember, I already spoiled it, so don't be surprised. But um, again, lots of necrosis, lots of edema, lots of inflammation, lots of changes that we can see. There's obviously changes going on. We can see them at different levels, different ultrastructural levels when we examine the animals. But we can't see a causative agent, a smoking gun, if you will. So no, no, uh, no obvious pathogens. But why not? Do we actually wash them away in some of the preservation methods that we use? Our routine preservation technique for looking at light microscope of tissues is to preserve things in formalin. Anyone who's gone through college knows about formalin and, you know, frogs in formalin and whatever in formalin. So that's what we do. But we also use formalin, believe it or not, as a treatment um, for fish, for uh, invertebrates, because it does kill and remove surface bacteria and surface, surface pathogens. So we actually use it as a treatment. So it is possible that in the process of trimming the tissues and preserving them, we've actually killed the organisms responsible for the disease and washed them off. That's possible. The other possibility, if, if it's a pathogen, because there are other things that be, could be causing this process. So the other possibility, if it's a pathogen, is it's something that's too small for us to see right now with the tests that we've been able to do so far. So tiny organisms like viruses or prions, very small structurally, uh, or structurally very small organisms that could have come in, done their damage, and left, and then left the animal open to all sorts of other processes which eventually, um, and quite quickly, result in its death. So next steps, as far as that kind of ultra-structural examination the animals go, is scanning and transmission my microscopy. That's can be done um, at the University of Connecticut, <coughs> primarily. Um, the other uh, thing we're doing is trying to examine um, the tissues in a special bone lab that doesn't use formalin, doesn't decalcify tissues before sectioning them um, to try and preserve any surface pathogens that we may have eliminated just by the methods we've been using to date. So those are the next big thing. And then, and, and, and sort of more in detail under the transmission and the scanning electron microscopy stuff is um, using different techniques to try and preserve the surface so we can look at things that might have been on the surface of those animals that could have started this whole thing that we just missed to date. So those windows of opportunity are still out there. We still have to investigate them. Kind of cool, and I think incredible, is the genomic analysis of these animals. So now we're looking for pathogens not using kind of methods where we can actually see the pathogens, but we're hunting them using the sophisticated DNA techniques. A lot of this stuff is being done at Cornell University. These are massive, huge processing, computer time, sophisticated techniques where people are actually mapping, sequencing out and mapping out all of the DNA inside these animals. This is huge undertaking. 
uh, you know, there's a couple of stats there. This is Ian Hewson. He's a great guy. He came from um, Cornell, spent the day with us last week, provided a few slides for us. I said, listen, I need some wowie, zowie factoids, okay? So here's one. 12,000 viruses live in your gut all the time. Are you going to die from those things? No. And um, we're talking not just 12,000 viruses. 12,000 different viruses live in your GI tract all the time, okay? And those are perfectly normal, perfectly well adapted. We all have the stats on how many organisms live in a drop of seawater, but it is in the thousands of different types of species live in a drop of seawater. All of those things can live on the surface of, of these sea stars. So trying to figure out what's normal, what's abnormal, what could be normal but causing abnormal reaction under a certain uh, set of circumstances, that's what, we're, that's what we're gunning for right now. So showing you some, some techniques here and just showing you the process of trying to filter out what's normal and abnormal. Again, it's using normal tissue, or at least tissue that appears to us to be normal, and comparing it to known diseased animals at various stages of their, of their disease. So, um, and how do you do it? You use a blender, very sophisticated, high tech. This is called the, uh, uh, the guys upstairs, the, uh, our vet guys, what was that blender called? Nestor Bullet. Bullet, yeah, apparently it's a good one. I don't know. But um, anyway, so you go in and you basically perf you, you make a milkshake out of the whole organism. And that means the DNA from your sea star, and it means all the DNA and RNA from all those viruses and bacteria, funguses, protozoa, whatever, are all mixed in there. And this is what happens. You start sequencing them. I don't know, all, all, oh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm aging myself, but do you remember that day when it was announced, it was all over the radio, I mean, they got a Nobel Prize for it, the team mapped out the human genome. It was about a 24-year process to map out the human genome. That's two billion base pairs, all right? These guys can sequence that every hour now. That's how much the technology has changed. So, so far, we've not only sequenced nine billion base pairs of DNA and RNA, and I'm, but what I mean by me is I, I, you know, I do Facebook all day. I mean the guys in Cornell. Um, and they've actually been able to determine what species of bacteria and viruses those things belong to. How do you do that? I don't know. But it is a lot of computer work that uses databases that are provided, because every time we discover a new organism, we provide that DNA to a DNA library. That is uh, freeware, basically, and it's available to everybody. It gets punched in these computers. They map things out. They just start sequencing and comparing sequences, and then as they, they just move that DNA out. And whatever's left, they have to then sequence. It's a whole big pro. It's huge. It's a humongous undertaking. I'm trying to tell you there's reasons why we don't know what's going on. It's kind of a big deal. Um, what have we got so far? I don't know if you guys can read that, but so far we've identified over 1,200 different organisms in the tissues that we've submitted. All right, that's based on DNA alone, RNA DNA, sorry. Okay, and this is, this is cool because I understand this perfectly, and I, everyone else should, no, not really. But this is what happens, and they color code things. So DNA sequences that keep coming up again and again kind of mean that that organism is very common. All right, that's another thing you start looking for. Common is common. If there's something that's more common in a diseased animal versus something that's less com or, or more common in a normal animal, well, that kind of becomes sort of a smoking gun. So that's what we're going at. So we, we look at that. We, we can map all these things out. We can give them color codes, and we can find out that certain bacteria are very common. Certain bacteria are very rare. Certain viruses are there. Certain fungus are very, very rare. And you start to get sort of an idea of the organisms that are not only in there, but what might be involved in the disease process. Kind of an exciting method. And it is very, very cool, very high tech. No, so not only the bacteria I've been describing, but the viruses are out there. These, are the vi not, these aren't the virus species. These are the virus families that have been found so far. And within each family, there are hundreds of organisms that are, represent species within that family of viruses. So there's a huge number of organisms that are in there. And this is what's been going on. So we've got a whole pile of viruses that just infect the bacteria that are living on the sea star. That's normal for different viruses. Most viruses around the world infect certain bacteria, so you don't have to worry about them too much. Then there's um, algae on the surface of some of these um, animals. There's certain viruses in that. And then there's this interesting group of viruses that do infect animals. And we are finding a lot of viruses that are infecting the animal primarily as well. So lots of organisms, lots of information, lots of things to tease out.
I'm just trying to say we haven't been sitting around. Well, okay, I have been sitting around, but a lot of other people haven't been sitting around. So what do we know? I kind of have to stand back because I forgot what we know. But basically, we know that there's a very large number of organisms out there. And, and we cannot say for sure that a pathogen uh, is the smoking gun or there's, a, there's a, an organism that's causing disease. But we're starting to get the idea that there's an organism that might at least be involved in disease. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But, uh, you know, we, in veterinary school, we always talked about this triad um, of events in order to have true disease. You need a host, you need a pathogen, and you need the right environment for all those three things to come together. Like if, you know, if you're a, a perfectly immunocompetent um, individual, you can deal with a whole lot. If you're not immunocompetent, you're going to have a lot of more problems. You can come into contact with a parasite or a pathogen that's particularly violent, virulent. Okay, something that's particularly nasty, like anthrax or Ebola or something. Not many of us are going to be immune to that sort of thing. So that could cause a problem. Or you could be nutritionally suppressed. Your temperature might not be right. Um, you might be all worried about your taxes and get stressed out. Your immune system comes down. There might be environmental factors that have to come together. So it's not just, hey, we got the virus. Bang, that's the problem. There's always something else going on as well. There's always some environmental change. There's always a couple of viruses and a bacteria working in synergy. You know, a lot of our pneumonias start as, as viruses, but when they're bad, like these are human pneumonias, they actually have a secondary mycoplasma or other bacteria that actually makes it really bad, or, or you know, even worse, a fungus um, that makes it really, really bad. See what I mean? So that's where we are. We, we got a lot of information, but we need to tease it all out. Oh, did I switch the slide? No. So. Nothing has been ruled out. That's the bottom line. Except for maybe that Fukushima thing. I'm pretty sure that's, that's okay. Everyone can relax on that one. Um, so pathogens, so these are organisms that cause infectious disease, are still pretty high on the differential list. And that's based on the spread, the way the, this, um, this, this um, epizootic, for lack of a better word, has spread from animal to animal, region to region. It, kind of is in the pattern that a, an infectious disease would work as opposed to a widespread environmental event or um, uh, yeah, something like that. So it, it is working more like an infectious disease so far. Nothing's been ruled out. And again, remember that all that synergy stuff. It could be a whole bunch of things. We talked about sewage and runoff. That might have animals in a salinity that they shouldn't be in. That might predispose them to viruses that they would normally be able to withstand. They've got osmotic problems the way they go. You know, all that sort of stuff can still play into that. We've got a lot of um, spatial and temporal data to still be thrown into the works here. And again, we have a lot of people working on this stuff too, which is a blessing, but it's also a problem, right? Starts you know, yeah, you can get into a snare where there's too many cooks in the kitchen. Believe, believe me, we got a new fear, theory about every hour from this group, and as the more people jump in, there, there's a lot more. But that's all good. You just have to sit there and kind of tease it all out and wade through it and stuff. Jeff also alluded to, hey, you know, this might be completely normal. This may have happened. Um, we have a similar outbreak happening on the East Coast and completely unrelated species. Um, we've had cyclical outbreaks that are known to be caused by a pathogen, maybe not the same one. But we've got die-offs and sea stars that have been seen before. And hey, we've got die-offs in all sorts of species that have been seen repeatedly. Um, and when there's all these concepts of, of a herd immunity, and then you become too dense, and you start, there start to be sort of a, a critical number of animals that are l more susceptible or, or, or less immune or less resistant, and that triggers an outbreak. Because now you have enough animals that can get sick and start amplifying and hosting and moving away. We might have a situation where we might have an animal that's resistant but carrying something around that other animals are not resistant to. Is it a sea star that's walking around? Is it a sea cucumber or another, or another organism altogether? We might have that sort of situation going on. Um, so there, there's, there is a lot um, and it could be perfectly normal. It could just be a cyclical event. Jeff says he's been there and this is the value of having these long-term monitoring programs. There was more sunflower stars than ever before, and there were more and more and more. Well, the environment can only have, you know, you might take this home because it might scare you, but the environment can only support a certain number of each species. <laughs> All right? <laughs> that you should worry about, not the Fukushima thing. But <laughs> anyway, um, so, so and, and then things have to collapse, things have to change. So what, and that might be cool, you know, what is, um, what could be some organisms' misfortune is another one's opportunity. And there's already baby sunflower stars that look really normal popping around. 
So who cares, right? Well, it turns out everybody cares, which is cool. Um, you don't have no idea how long it took me to get this thing, print, um, this uh, thing here. But it's really, really important for us to investigate that. It's so cool that we live in a part of the world where we have the luxuries of having a very educated um, population, uh, relatively, you might not believe this because it's tax time, um, relatively um, well-off population and an incredibly environmentally and animal wel welfare conscious population. And that, you know, we, I'm Canadian too, so you know. But the American guys on our borders are, are the same way and they're very, very concerned too. Um, so that's really cool because that means there's lots of people out there, lots of people concerned. And, and you know what? It's not the end of the world to freak out and go Fukushima because that just brings attention and people wanting to discover things. And that's the important part because the more we learn, the better decisions we can have. And who knows? There might be a human related cause. There might be ways that humans might be affected by this. Maybe not directly, but in the types of species that might collapse as a result of sunflower stars and other sea stars are collapsing. There, there, there are keystone species here. What happens to one species that we might think of as insignificant has huge ramifications up and down the ecosystem. We know that time and time again. Um, so it is important to find these things out. And it's important to get involved. And it's important that you're out here and, and learning and interesting. I mean, nothing could be cooler. We live in a great place. Um, and so the bottom line is don't panic, um, get out there, support wildlife um, research and investigation. It's really, really cool. We're doing good things. We're always going to learn something new and there's going to be good, some good stuff out there. So thank you very much. Great. We have um, some time for some questions if anybody, or comments, if anybody would like to go ahead. Wondering, I saw Noah was up on the slides in a lot of universities. Not, has DFO showed any interest? Yeah, they the were. Canadian government in any way, shape, or form? Yeah, they so fired I'm, all their scientists. I'm going to repeat the questions oh, just to ha so that we have it um, on the mic system. But the question was Is DFO involved in any of this research? And I was going to be really facetious and say that no, they are, most definitely. They were in the bottom left corner. It said Canada and the Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Yeah, most definitely. Um, they, they are involved and, and concerned. Um, there were uh, more American institutions involved. You have to remember, um, this is something that is now um, affecting sea stars all the way from Alaska down to, to California and probably through Baja as well. We're just not in, in touch down there as well. So it is widespread and there's lots of institutions involved. All right. Question in the front here. Yep. Okay, so the question is, do, can scuba divers pass this on to other sea stars? Well, certainly, uh, if you don't dry your gear, you know, rinse it in chlorinated water and dry your gear, it's possible. But the fact is, the way we've seen it spread, um, it has gone geographically where we've had the highest densities of starfish uh, up the Sunshine Coast. And we do have divers who are going to areas around Whidbey Island uh, it, it seems there are pockets of very low density sunflower stars where the sunflower stars are, uh, last I heard, it's, it's starting to show up around Whidbey Island on the inside, but uh, these are divers who go to other areas and I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you should worry about that. It's much more important that we have this terrific involvement of the dive community and they're going online and they're sending their video and their counts and we're getting the information. What's really remarkable, I think, is the amount of collaboration is, is going through us and other aquariums to the vets, and uh, we're seeing society take care of it. There was a question, you know, is the taxpayer doing this or our government? Well, actually, no, that ain't the way it's happening. It's, it's us doing it, and that's terrific. All right, how about, um, yes, the lady in the back. Yes. Okay, so no. the question is yeah. concerning the sea stars on the Atlantic coast and if there was anything um, determined of what caused that. Uh, coincidentally, you probably saw um, uh, University of Rhode Island, um, University of Connecticut, all those folks were involved in that die-off. No, they're no further ahead, but they're definitely working with us and involved. So we've got the same group of people involved. 
I think one of the nice things here is we've been a little bit more prepared, a little bit more proactive in terms of trying to get especially fresh known tissue to animals, or to, to the animals, excuse me, to the, to the investigators. Okay, do you have any more? Um, the lady in the glasses right here, in the red vest. And the questions concerning a PAVO virus, if I'm pronouncing that right, and if this has been ruled out. Uh, no, not at all. In, in fact, the, the, the sort of pathogen, um, as, as at least part of the cause, is very much primary. Um, I'm not sure whether PAVO virus specifically um, would be, you know, one to look at, but certainly PAVO virus is among the, you know, myriad of families of viruses that we're looking at. Yeah, but, and, and you're absolutely right, it could be, uh, and we have this so much, it's, uh, you know, some environmental thing, then a virus has opportunity, then a bacteria kind of opens that hole, and then bad things really happen. Yeah, sorry. Okay, question right here in the front. Um, can you anticipate how this die-off is going to affect the rest of the ecosystem, how it's going to change life, for example, in the house sound? Well, it happened first right around Vancouver and it, it, it's pretty well over in Southern Howe Sound and we've already we've already been distributing some results because we do monitor seabeds so we're getting a bigger biodiversity and a little more stability of numbers and this is pretty typical when you have something that's overpopulated and it gets brought down s sea otters are famously repopulated to areas where they transplanted them and what you find is you have a very high biodiversity but a very low abundance of all the different things because they snack on it all and they keep things down. So we immediately saw lots of seaweeds and all. We expect that. Uh, one of the things we're concerned with in House Sound because over the last third of a century that I've been there, I've seen any number of green urchin barren phenomenons. Uh, and of course, sea stars and sea urchins are in the same group. They're the ones that do really well around human sewage. They thrive and, and they get overpopulated, we're already seeing the beginnings of what could become urchin barrens in some parts of House Sound, but not in others. And uh, it's very fascinating because we're, we're, remember, we're only human and we can't anticipate anything. We're right now seeing, and we've got some guys like Doug Swanson and Neil McDaniel there, we're seeing tiny, tiny baby agarum blades. It's the first recruitment event for agarum I've ever seen in my life. Uh, what's that? It's a perennial kelp, and they're one of the types of kelp bed that literally got mowed down by the Pycnopodia explosion. And uh, to see the tiny little blades is just wonderful. But we're seeing tiny little green urchins. <laughs> and so the yeah. race is on. <laughs> but, uh, so anyhow, uh, we're watching. We're out there. But we don't know. We can't predict. Now, I actually have four questions here from our YouTube viewers. <gasps> First time ever. I keep um, thinking you're saying you too, and I'm a big fan. But <laughs> <laughs> any other were any other echinoderms affected? Is you mean question. other than sea stars? Because we, we covered stars. all the, the sea stars. Um, yeah. What we've found during this process, one of the dive resorts said, "Well, you know, our divers go out and report that all the red urchins have lost their spines, and so it does seem to be normal to see that a, a, an overabundance of urchins has suddenly dropped out." And of course, I'm always assuming that there's a wolf feel or a sea otter or something that eats urchins. And so when we see a huge abundance of, of green urchins and then suddenly they're gone, and I've seen that, I've always tended to think, what ate them? What ate them? Because I'm only human. I'm afraid of being eaten. What killed them off? It could have been a bug. So uh, definitely the, we've seen urchin explosions that suddenly disappear. Mm -hmm. But I think the divers have been on this one because it's so gross looking, uh, we notice. Okay, I'll do one more from the YouTube. Um, are any species or individuals, have they recovered from their sickness or is it always been a death sentence? In the aquariums, um, it has for the most part been a death sentence. I wanna say that there've been a couple of what we call more resistant species like leather stars or bat stars that have recovered. 
but this is where you start. You also get into this mode where there's a lot of information now. Everyone's looking for it. Those animals may have had something completely different and then recovered. Because again, we don't know what's going on. But but those animals recovered from got sick and recovered from something. But it'd be so hard to tell you that it was actually that disease. I'd like to on the same question say that. We are seeing down near Seattle, very close to us in Puget Sound, that a lot of the mortalities are the purple stars. We're seeing the etiology and the mm -hmm. species affected being different geographically. Here in House Sound and Burrard Inlet, it was sunflower stars. And for a long time, we saw the leather stars just getting obese. They were getting huge, and we, we were seeing a lot of them right up until Christmas, but a few people have seen some of them get sick. So. In terms of immunity and recovery, I don't know, but the, the pink stars, which Marty mentioned, we didn't have time for the whole presentation. The sick thing about pink stars, they're fairly well dispersed on open seabed, and they, it's as if they sniffed these piles of necrotic debris, and they'd come in, glom on, get sick, and die. And we've actually seen them aggregating in areas where they would subsequently die. And so it, it seems in that case that they're stuffing themselves in to death, literally. Okay. Um, now let's take another question from the audience here. Um, I can see with the light, but yes, this one. Oh, right here. So the question is, if the crabs are eating the sea stars, will it affect the crabs and subsequently other organisms eat the crabs? Probably, um, probably not. Um, again, you can't rule anything out. Um, if it's a pathogen, and more than likely there's a virus just because we can't see it, and everybody's been looking so hard for it. So if it was a bacteria, I gotta believe that we have, would have seen it in all the tissues we've submitted. So if it's a pathogen and if it's a virus, virus t tend to be, because they rely on the host DNA for reproduction, they tend to be very, very host specific. So it, it would be difficult, not impossible, but difficult to be jumping through taxa that are more varied. Um, but, you know, but again, um, you know, it's, it might not be a pathogen. It still might be a toxin and it might be um, some to toxin that's very persistent. The other sort of flip side to saying that probably not is because, you know, in, in our aquarium, in, in uh, Seattle Aquarium and other aquariums where we've had sea stars die off in the aquarium, we've watched them very closely. We know what animals they've been with and we just keep really close tabs on all those things and we, we haven't had reports of any other big taxa affected. Um, and then, uh, you know, based on our, our surveys and stuff, people are so, they're looking for everything. No other big groups of animals, no other crustaceans or, or, or other, you know, more varied taxa have been affected out there either, I think. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, we're also divers, and we dive at Whitecliff almost every week, and we've noticed that there's an explosion of brittle stars. All right, the question. Oh, sorry, go on. And we're just wondering, are brittle stars involved? In the well, they're, they're not that close to sea stars, and we have seen no mortality amongst them, so it's an opportunity for them to explode, and brittle stars are among the types of invertebrates that have that ability to rapidly get abundant. And when you see brittle stars, you see them in abundance, and it's, it's cool, so enjoy them. <laughs> uh, they make great food for a lot of other animals, so probably something's gonna move in on them, but uh, that's very normal. And somehow, I'm, I'm a chauvinist, I have to admit it, I'm not as upset. When I see huge abundances of brittle stars, I think, oh, just awesome. But when I was seeing these walls of sea stars, I was going, oh man, what gives? How's this gonna resolve itself? This is terrible. I don't know why, that was my reaction. Um, just to summarize that in case you didn't hear it, there, um, the scuba divers had noticed an explosion of brittle stars in their areas where they dived. Okay, yes, on the left over here. We've consistently seen babies, and, and actually Neil McDaniel's right here now. Um, the, some of his photos, you can actually see the babies in amongst the dying adults. And so, uh, I don't know, are you allowed to say everything that's? 
that Ian <laughs> talked about? <laughs> no, I mean, I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, no, I, there's, there's nothing to hide, but um, maybe I wasn't told something. Well, um, Donna was told at dinner by Ian, uh, Neil, your babies that you sent in, they're filthy with virus, but they're perfectly healthy animals. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they have their own viral communities, but not necessarily pathogenic. So it's, it's interesting, and we're a little scared about that because one thing we're interested in doing in our curatorial group is putting these baby, healthy-looking, healthy-acting sunflower stars in the display that we dedicate to sunflower stars and see what happens. And so uh, we'll have to think carefully about this over the next few weeks because uh, there are lots of questions for Marty and for the, the curatorial group. Uh, if we're going to try that. Okay, I'll take one more question from YouTube here. Um, are healthy or infected sea stars used for your DNA sequencing, and did it make a difference, or does it make a difference? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so the point of the sampling was to, to sample uh, the same species and, and sample healthy as well as unhealthy animals. And then as far as that genomic work, to, to look at very, both groups very closely, and then by you know basically by subtraction sequencing, so sequencing everything and then subtracting what's different, figuring figuring out what was different between the two groups. Yeah, so definitely, okay. they're being looked at. Okay, another question here. How about the gentleman in the center? Has there been any uh, any thought about the uh, the uh, uh, deadliness of these or the ability of these viruses to from the medical community about looking at how fast this virus spreads in a species and whether that's at all comparable in a model to how fast a virus, a, a really pathogenic virus that might develop for humans. Before, so before Marty answers, uh, repeat uh, it. Uh, 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 before she repeats it, I've got to tell you one thing that <laughs> one thing Marty really wanted He's when so we took the vets out on the boat, he wanted to smell it. The first thing he wanted to say, get some of the real goo. I want to smell it. And we were so disgusted by this <laughs> smell. Anyway, I was actually playing a oh, practical Well, joke. the question <laughs> is, how quickly does the virus spread? And has it, has it been looked at how contagious it could be to other? And whether it's, it could be used as a model for other diseases. So, um, uh, you know, again, uh, we're jumping on the virus thing. Virus is just one possibility. And, and, and viruses tend to be very taxa-specific. So it is very... It would be very rare. I, I don't know of a virus that's ever jumped from something that's so remotely related to us as a sea star to a human. I mean, it'd be very rare. Rabies is about the, the virus that can affect, uh, you know, the biggest variety of species, but they're all mammals, if you know what I mean. Like, and, and, and so they, they tend to be very specific. Um, as far as models go, I, I think that in the human side of things, there's so many models um, based on, on human um, viruses and, and also primate viruses that are closely related that it, they're probably not as interested but they might be if we find something that, that's a whole other thing so if we, if we do find a particular virus um, then, then it becomes more of, it, of more interest yeah okay there there was a question up here at the back on the left there oh it, yes go ahead um. Oh, well, so very famous. Oh. The question is, have there been sea star dives in areas other than here and the Atlantic? So Some of the most famous have had to do with, um, for example, the urchins in the Mediterranean, I mean the, the Caribbean Sea, had a complete die-off. And so die-offs amongst the Echinodermata are pretty well documented. And, and in fact, the, when the didema mortality occurred, the ecology was broadly published upon as well. So yeah, this, it does seem to be that this is a group of animals that gets overabundant and drops dead. Okay, um, yes, right here. I'm curious if this has occurred in the colder waters So does, okay, so has the sea star die-off occurred in colder waters? 
So, you know, one of the thought, you know, there's all the jargon words that, that come out. So Fukushima is one. Glo global warming was obviously another one that people are really looking at. Um, the, the, the problem with it is, is um, it certainly started um, when we had fairly warm water. Uh, and, we, and we've had, I would say, uncharacteristically warm water in this region this year. Can I say that? We're on the La Nina side of it, actually, this year. So it hasn't been remarkably warm. Um, never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, as waters have chilled, like through December and January, we're still seeing, um, I would say, even more rapid spread. So uh, I don't think it is directly related to a warming trend. But I'd say other parts of the world. Like right. So this particular outbreak is, is, is Pacific. So it's all California through, through to um, Alaska. And, and in general, it's been you know, during the cooling months that we've seen an increase. Okay, gentleman in the blue hoodie. Um, if, I, if I got what you were saying correctly earlier, you were saying it was first noticed around Vancouver. Is that, is that correct? And if so, is there a way of tracking? Um, well, I missed I miss the very first part of that. So if I'm, if I'm repeating stuff, okay. excuse me. So was the sea star die first noticed in Vancouver? Is that your question? Yeah, okay. So has it been, you know, is there a way of tracking and where that started? And is there a way of tracking where it started? Boy, howdy. Go to our website. Um, yeah. I, I actually gave the early part of this presentation to our staff, and I put sort of a gag order on my staff and said, we're not showing that map, because I, I saw too many problems right away with, where I could interpret it incorrectly. I, I knew it was hard to interpret. It is now a very detailed, very interactive map. So if you go to this on our web, um, you'll find these, and, and you have to spend a lot of time. It's, it's on Google Earth, and the, it did first get seen in Burrard Inlet and Howe Sound, and, uh, and then moved up to Sunshine Coast, then down to Puget Sound, then across to Vancouver Island. Uh, and unfortunately, there was a lull in the Christmas season. Um, like I said, we lost our boat engine, and so we've been out of the water. But uh, there's, there's more attention now. And then the other thing is that interpreting the maps is tricky because you see evidence of healthy types and such and, and less around House Sound. That's because a lot of starfish have died off in House Sound. There's not much mortality to report if they aren't, they're not there. That was my first problem was that things were being reported as normal. I said, hey, hey, no, they all died there. That's not normal. So we've, we've we're, we're trying to get as much information as possible to the public in a way that's comprehensible, but we have to give you the caveat that, that it's really intense because there's so many different species, so many different stages, and then we can't ask, we can't demand that volunteers keep going back. And the one thing I plea is if you, if you see it happening, go back again and again. Some people are able to go back only on weekends, but we failed because we had so many sites we wanted to cover by time we covered them. It is all over. Okay. Um, how about right over here on the right-hand side? Yep. On the previous slide, uh, it said next steps you're going to be looking at, uh, or, or the team is going to be looking at uh, lab experiments on transmission. Um, it strikes me as odd that sequencing was happening before lab experiments on transmission were happening. Can you comment on, is it, is it harder to do that with the sequence? Or? So the question was, why was sequencing performed bef uh, studied before the transmission studies? It's 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 a chicken and egg thing. Um, so first off, um, you have dying sea stars and you have samples. So you need to go and analyze those samples and look for things that are in there. Um, so that that's opportunistic. Uh, to set up transmission studies means permits. Um, animal Care Committee um, uh, sign-offs. You need to know what you're transmitting um, or some idea of it. You don't really know that until you've started screening things that have died. We, we talk about Koch's postulates, which is a uh, kind of the, the fundamental four steps of determining whether a disease is infectious and caused by something infectious. So um, it, it, it does take some time to do that, and you need a facility 
to, to go ahead and do that. You know, like if I go, hey, Vancouver Aquarium, uh, do you mind if I infect the rest of your sea stars today and see if it's, well, there's a bit of a balancing game there. And certainly there are individuals that are, are doing that and, and, uh, and some really good work is being done, particularly in California on that stuff. But, um, you know, the, you know, the flip side of this thing, we actually don't have any more Pycnopodia. Like, we don't have any in the aquarium, and, uh, and there might be some young, young animals coming in, but I think our opportunity to be involved in that sort of study has, has come and gone. Like, it, it, we just couldn't do it in the time that, that it took. We did get a proper proposal from a professional veterinarian um, in a center that deals with this kind of thing. And I looked at it and gasped and said, not in our lifetimes, not on our budgets, not with our facilities. It's just, it's huge. So what you're saying has been omitted is actually the most enormously expensive uh, step. Okay, any more questions? Um, you're pointing over, I can't see, that's why. All right, lady standing up waving her hand at me, okay. So the question is that Cornell has quite detailed research facilities and do we have comparable facilities here and support? Um, so first of all, nothing live is going across any border. These are deep frozen samples for the DNA extractions and they're formalin fixed tissues that are going for histopathology. So there's nothing live is going anywhere. But um, secondly, um, you go where the expertise and the interest is. So. You go where um, you start working and collaborating. Um, there is a marine invertebrate disease group at Cornell. There is no marine invertebrate disease group here. Um, and, and it makes some sense. You don't, uh, you know, there's only so much money and funding to go around, right? So you want to concentrate the expertise where it is. And, and it's a very small world. I can get samples to Cornell the next day. It's not a big deal. And I know who I'm dealing with, and that person has dealt with multiple samples, and, and everything's good. So, um, I, I, no, I, I, don't, I don't think DFO's got that particular expertise, but I don't think anyone else in the world's got that particular expertise either. Okay. Is there someone I can't see? All right. Yes, another one in the back. Uh, how long ago were the CSR samples that are in the aquarium collected? Okay, so how long ago were the sea stars collected here? How long were they here before they died off? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Uh, some of the sea stars, um, particularly the sunflower stars, have been here for many, many years. Um, the people haven't collected the animals in, in this facility. I, I don't think some of the aquarists could actually remember the last time Pycnopodia was collected. So they may, be, may have been here 15 or 20 years. And it, it happened well, we didn't have the kinds of populations, but of course we don't have high population density, so it, it didn't occur suddenly here. It was already over in House Sound when we started seeing it here. Okay, how about right here in the middle? Could this be something that's been lying dormant? For 10, 15 years? Uh, sure, and then triggered by something. Sure, a lot of pathogens work like that. They're just with you, and then all of a sudden, some set of environmental factors changes, and, and away you go. I doubt it, though. I want to say, I'm pretty sure, just the way it's spread, that it's probably waterborne, um, and it just met, it's a, um, you know, a lot of pathogens, it's dilution is a solution to pollution, is what we have the mantra in vet school. So it's just, you get enough of it concentrated, and then you're going to get spread of disease. Well, our water comes from House Sound, or from Burrard Inlet. Yeah. Okay, down in the right, did you have a question? No, okay. <laughs> Up on the left here. Uh, will understanding how this mortality event occurred help uh, prevention or understanding of it happening in the future? Okay, well, understanding how the mortality event occurred, will that help us understand how we can prevent it in the future? 
I've never seen such a mobilization of citizen science and professional science uh, for anything with relatively economically unimportant invertebrates before. So uh, I think we've got our eyes open wider now. I'll, I'll answer that as well. And um, it, to me, it's all about cumulative knowledge. Um, mortality is normal. Get take home message you guys. It's, it's normal. <laughs> um, broad scale mortality events can look very devastating, um, but they could be normal, right? Um, so you may not even want to prevent it if you could prevent it. On the flip side of things, there might be something directly that we're doing that could be uh, causing it, influencing it, causing it to spread to animals that it wouldn't normally spread to. Um, so the first step of all this is investigation and keeping calm and finding the answers, working with everyone you can, um, and, and getting sound science done. And from that, then, you decide normal, not normal. Can we do something? And if we can do something, should we do something? Because you, you might, you might, it might be a bad thing to actually start interfering with a natural process. Okay, any more questions? Yes, okay. Um, is there any, any, any samples taken of the actual water in the area? That okay, so have, have there been any water samples taken in the areas where the sea stars have been dying? Y yes, uh, absolutely. And, and certainly the, the normal gambit of um, tests have been done, you know, that you, physical parameters have been done. And our monitor um, constantly, anyway, we have, you know, remote sampling sa uh, stations all up and down the coast that, that do everything from chlorophyll to pH and, and away we go. Um, we've also done um, more so in the U.S. than here, just, be, uh, just the way the die-off progressed and, and where new areas are. Um, then we do um, uh, some filtered uh, sampling. Cause now we've been talking about this with the group, believe me, we've not been on a few conference calls, but they're like, you know, can we sequence the water, right? <laughs> well, what is that going to tell you, right? And so everyone's kind of come to the conclusion that sequencing the animals and what's on the animals is more important, because who knows what's in the water? Yeah, you can do it. It's, uh, you know, I forgot to mention this stuff is expensive as well. Um, <laughs> but uh, it always comes up. Um, it does. Um, so, so the decision was made, for, is particularly for the DNA sampling stuff, um, to, to concentrate on the animals themselves. But there has been some filtration of samples taken. Um, the other thing we, we talk about are toxins, and, and hunting toxins is incredibly complicated because it's, it's not something you can grow or sequence the DNA on. It's very much related, you know, looking for it is, is physical chemistry. And, and really when you're looking for toxins, unless you know what you're looking for, everyone's been watching too much CSI, by the way. Um, <laughs> and you know, like you just, you know, slip the thing and you run your gel chromatograph and it's, oh, it's obviously this weird chemical that no one's ever heard of. It doesn't work like that so simply. So you kind of have to almost know what you're looking for in order to, to find it as far as toxicology goes, unfortunately. Okay. Okay, so the question is, what other disciplines are involved in the research other than the marine um, researchers? Well, this is like taxonomy, right? Um, you, you, you can be as, uh, when, you, when you talk about differences within species, like to some people a starfish is a starfish, to some people a marine researcher is a marine researcher. But within us, we've got clinical veterinarians, we've got pathologists, we've got molecular biologists, we've got marine biologists, we've got this, um, the uh, virologists, the bacteriologists, we've got um, echinoderm experts, we've got um, protozoologists going into town, we've got um, the physical chemistry guys, so we've got um, the satellite experts, the um, primary production experts, so the chlorophyll guys, the uh, algae guys work in. Um, we've got um, the um, uh, oceanographic type guys, so currents and weather patterns and, and chemistry, those guys are, are coming in on the sidelines as well. Um, you know, it goes from, like I say, you know, everyone from a 12-year-old walking down the beach that notices something wrong and would like to help, 
to a guy like Jeff that's just dedicated his life and has got a whole pile of degrees um, and is a true expert in this and, and everyone in between. And um, so it's fun. I mean, you're on the phone with people who've never talked to a veterinarian before, right? Or, um, you know, never thought a veterinarian would be interested in a sea star disease. But disease is a disease. Chemistry is chemistry. Physiology is physiology. It's all exciting and interesting. We're all learning kind of new things. So I, I think that's, I mean, all science is going that way. You know, no paper is written by one guy anymore, right? It's, and, and it's not just a pile of veterinarians that write a paper, but you always have the, all these different people. And even within veterinarians, I mean, we've got pathologists and epidemiologists and ophthalmologists and internal medicine people, you know, blah, blah, blah. it goes and goes and goes. Depends on how specific you want to get. But it, it is pretty amazingly varied, so it's definitely a multidisciplinary approach. And big collaboration. I mean, everybody's happy to collaborate. That's very cool. There are no secrets and no one's being mean. It's kind of neat. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we'll take one more question. So the lady in the back there. Um, no, not her. Sorry. Not her. Coming back isn't quite right because they were there when the die-off was occurring. They're, they're right there. Neil's pictures in particular, they're right there. And you just have to zoom in because they're great photos. Um, and it was commented on th that in Puget Sound, there was huge reproduction. This was a particularly robust year for sunflower starfish reproduction. And hey, that could be part of it. It could have been that it really weakened them by the end of the summer, uh, blown out all their gonads. Uh, I don't know. So. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'd like to thank our two honored speakers tonight. I think sea stars are a large part of Va Vancouverite's life. We see them hiking when we go kayaking, and we maybe feel close to them, um, even though they are echinoderms. So um, <laughs> I feel honored to actually have the opportunity to hear two um, doctors who are actually at the forefront of research and getting up-to-date information and, and perhaps keeping in touch so that I can know what I can do to help the sea stars in the future. So um, let's all give the job. And our thanks to all of you. So I just wanted to um, say thank you for coming also and that uh, you may get an email in the next few days with a survey um, that will help public programming determine what your interests are or if you have any ideas, you can put them down. And I will be reading all the comments at the end of the surveys as well, so you can put random thoughts about life if you like and, and entertain me. Um, <laughs> um, there is a donation box on the way out if um, you'd like to support the Vancouver Crams conservation efforts, and I look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. <laughs>